Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 178. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy to use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit therapynotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes today. Just use the promo code TherapyChat when you sign up for a free trial at therapynotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and I'm coming back to you after a week of no new episode. Glad to be back and still getting caught up. Things things got a little out of sync and getting back to it. I just finished up my last weekend of sensory motor psychotherapy level two training, which is a huge deal for me. 180 CEUs from that. So that means 180 hours spent in that study. It's it's wonderful. And I'm so grateful to have completed that. And I'm also going to be grateful to have my weekends back for a little bit. So let's just dive right into today's episode. My guest today is Eileen Russell. She's a clinical psychologist in private practice in New York City and New Jersey author of a book on resilience and affective experiential psychotherapy that is called Restoring Resilience, Discovering Your Client's Capacity for Healing. Eileen is senior faculty at and founding member of the AEDP Institute, through which she teaches and supervises psychotherapists who are learning accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy. She's on the faculty of the National Institute for Psychotherapy's Integrative Trauma Program, And she's generally interested in integrative approaches to psychotherapy, particularly those that emphasize psychodynamic and experiential models. Eileen believes the most effective psychotherapies combine depth with the power of a focus on the positive change processes and resilience. She has taught and trained people in AEDP nationally and internationally, and she loves talking about AEDP. She said that she might come back and talk about it more with me on Therapy Chat, which I'm really excited about. But today she's going to talk about resilience. So we've all heard a lot about resilience and we have our own interpretations of what that means. So I hope you will enjoy listening to my interview with Eileen Russell. Therapy Chat Podcast wouldn't exist without the support of its listeners. If you'd like to become a member, please go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. By making a $1 per month donation, you can help Therapy Chat keep going over the long haul. Thank you for your support. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am very honored and excited to bring you a conversation with someone who is going to talk about a topic that I know we hear about all the time the topic of resilience. My guest today is Dr. Eileen Russell. Eileen is the author of the book, Restoring Resilience, Discovering Your Client's Capacity for Healing. And she is a very accomplished person in many other ways, but let's just dive right in. Eileen, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat. Thank you for inviting me, Laura. It's a pleasure. I'm excited. I feel like I can't wait to ask you about this, but before we start, can you just tell our audience a bit about yourself and your work? Yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm in practice in New York City and Montclair, New Jersey. And I primarily do something called AEDP, Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy. And I'm on the faculty of the AEDP Institute, where I teach AEDP, I supervise, train people. I also am on the faculty of the National Institute of Psychotherapies trauma program where I teach a bit about resilience. I have three kids and 
two cats. <laughs> I was going to say dog. No. Okay. Two cats. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for that little introduction. And I'm, I contacted you initially, as you and I were discussing earlier, I contacted you because I had heard about your book and I wanted to learn more about your perspective on resilience and, and our clients innate resilience and all of our, not just our clients, but all of us. And then I found out that you were involved in AEDP, which if I were more on top of things with AEDP, I should have known with you being on the faculty that you're not just involved, you're really involved. So I'm, I'm really eager to ask you about that too, because I find that people who do AEDP as therapists are really passionate about it. And yet I've never really quite understood exactly like what it is. So I hope that I can dive into that a little bit with you if we have enough time. But first, let's just talk about your book a bit. Who is this book for? Well, the book, you know, though I'm coming most primarily from an AEDP perspective, I'm also trained in uh, EMDR and Eugene Genlin's uh, focusing. So I kind of come from an experiential dynamic perspective. It's really written for a larger audience of people who are interested in resilience from a clinical perspective perspective and trying to understand what resilience is and how is that a useful concept for for clinicians. And I think through that, I wind up introducing people to AEDP because I have, you know, the book is full of transcripts of actual sessions that are annotated and highlighted to kind of teach, you know, what we, what we would see happening in the, in the therapeutic encounter from an AEDP perspective and what the interventions are, are about. That's awesome. So it's really a book for clinicians or people who are studying clinical work. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it, it's, yeah, it's not really written for people outside of the field, although I can imagine if there are people outside the field who are really interested in it, then, you know, it might be, but it might be a little too technical, yeah. Some ways are technical for for lay people. Gotcha. Okay, so um, so let's just talk about what the concept of resilience is to you. Well, when I started writing about it, it actually Norton Norton suggested the topic a number of years ago when it was kind of the the height of interest in the concept of resilience, and I realized that we may have been importing this kind of American pull yourself up by the bootstraps idea of resilience into a clinical context where I think it really, that way of understanding resilience doesn't belong. And for people who know about AEDP, a different way of understanding resilience seems kind of natural. And I think that incorporates what we understand about, you know, trauma, the use of defenses to protect the self and and how people um, adapt to their circumstances to try to get by. So what we know is that when people are adapting to really adverse circumstances, they will do things that when they try to tra- they translate those adaptations in healthier circumstances seem dysfunctional or even pathological. And we miss the resilience that's in that because at, from a, an ADP perspective, we understand that defenses are created or come upon, learned or adapted in circumstances where the possibilities for other responses were pretty limited, maybe interpersonally or for whatever was going on. So I think I wanted a way of understanding resilience in a, in a broader way that felt like it was, that it would resonate for clinicians. And I think most of us have probably had many experiences of working with people, especially with very severe trauma, who just amaze us Mm -hmm. at their capacity to get up and move on or to make something of their lives or to get themselves through school or to have healthy relationships with their children, even though they have very little to lean back on in terms of modeling from their own parents. So I think we see resilience all the time, but we also see where people really really suffer. And it took me a few years to kind of come upon what I, what I think I was understanding as the essence of resilience. And this is what I write about in the book, which is how I understand it is the self's differentiation from that, which is aversive to it. 
So it's, it's a little bit of a kind of metaphysical or existential positing of that there is a place within all of us where whatever aversive things have happened to us, whether through abuse, neglect, oppression, um, marginalization, hatred, enmeshment, where all of those kind of environmental relational things that have happened to us are, are one, not us. And there's this space between those things and, and us. So it's how we're differentiated from what has happened to us, which is not to say that the things that have happened to us also don't shape us. But that's how I think about kind of the essence of resilience. Yeah. So thank you for that. And I would like you to, if you don't mind, can you just say a little bit more about how it's differentiated from us? Because I think people can understand that term differentiation in a lot of different ways. And I just want to make sure the listeners are clear on what you mean. Yeah, I think I think of it almost like visually, like almost like the 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 you know the nucleus of a cell, <laughs> if that is the self, right? That there's a membrane around it that keeps it protected from everything that might otherwise corrode or annihilate it. So just that little space where we are not the things that have been done to us, we are not what we have experienced that has that has been or that have been diminishing or abusive or painful or hurtful in some way. And and I also think, I think just to maybe this kind of fleshes it out a little bit more, I, I kind of think of resilience as having a motto. And my motto for resilience is anything that's done on behalf of the self. And then that can range the the gamut from more kind of conservative resistance oriented adaptations, right? Where we're kind of pulled in, there's a conservation of energy and we're really in a self-protective mode to kind of more authentic and complex actualized expressions of resilience and thriving that we see when people are flourishing. And that resilience underlies that whole, that whole kind of continuum of how we adapt to different circumstances. Wow. Yeah. So I, I can sort of conceptualize to what you're saying and I want to, I don't know if I'm understanding it correctly, but where the N word, you know, could be pathologized as a person being shut down versus the flourishing is what we would call post-traumatic growth. Right. Yep. That, that all of that, everything on that spectrum that people do to cope and adapt with things that they can't control right. that are traumatic that occur is resilience. Yes, that it is, it is, it is these resilience processes that are being kind of brought on board on behalf of the self. Right. That's yeah. a beautiful perspective. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I do want to say, because I said this to you before, but to me, this is like kind of important that, you know, that what you mentioned in the beginning of this discussion about how our Americanized view of resilience is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There's two ways that I've heard in the clinical world. Well, not in the clinical world, more in the popular discussion, you know, in general public resilience is to my mind misused. And one is, you know, when a child has a traumatic childhood, including whether there's abuse, neglect, lack of emotional or physical needs being met, poverty, you know, growing up in an environment that was violent, even if they weren't the direct target of the violence, marginalization, oppression, all of the ways that people can be traumatized during childhood. And then our culture kind of says, well, you know, now you're 18 or you're 20. I mean, that kids are resilient, you know. Right, right, right. You should be over it by now. Right. I mean, why are you so worried about that? That was so long ago. You know, that's what they'll say to people in their 40s, 50s. And it's like, I know that we all don't want to feel. We want to keep going and keep, you know, get back to normal mm -hmm. no matter what we've been through. But but I that view of resilience is like, you just need to be resilient. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I think of that. I call that in my book, the Teflon phenomenon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That, um, you know, for a while after 9-11, I live in New Jersey, not far from, from um, New York City. And going into the Lincoln Tunnel, there's this enormous 
a billboard that said, you know, we're Jersey strong. And I don't remember what the images were, but the suggestion was that we're unaffected. Like we're not afraid. We're not, we don't get knocked down. We're strong and tough. So resilience feels like it's very equated with being tough. And I don't think that's what real resilience is about. And I I think clinically, that's not what we're striving for, right? Like if we think of resilience as something like, like a, an old supervisor of mine used to talk about it like a bamboo tree rather than an oak, you know, something mm-hmm. that has flexibility um, and can bend that when we're, we're, we're rigid, we, we might be strong in certain ways, but we're also rigid and we can't adapt to new circumstances. We can't bend. So to my mind, that's not real resilience. That's just toughness. And I, I think, I think there's a difference. Well, that's like pushing through to me. That's just like, Keep going, deny how you feel. Right. And, you know, I mean, to be fair, I think there's a there's a place for that too, right? And that's what a lot of our patients and clients sometimes just have to do. Like in traumatic circumstances where they do just have to push through, so to speak, they don't, they don't have a safe relational context in which to process what's happening for them, right? There isn't a place where they can kind of fall apart or way, where they can feel what they need to feel in order to process that and and have it be integrated and move on. They have to either deny things or they have to contain things and push things away in order to keep moving. And I think there's a place for that, right? But at some point, the reason why, you know, the example that you gave that so many people are still suffering so many years later is that they've internalized these traumatic experiences the sense of self that goes with that, not to mention the neurobiology that goes with with that. And they're looking for a place to, when they're coming into therapy, I think they're looking for a place and a person with whom they can unburden some of that. They can process some of the feelings and the self states that they hadn't been able to, because up until that point, maybe there wasn't an opportunity or what there wasn't a safe enough context and relationship in which to do it. Yeah. And then there, then, then I think they're on a path, you know, to becoming more resilient in a healthier way, you know, that we can be resilient in this kind of self-protective way, but ultimately that's not the goal of therapy, right? We want to help people be resilient in a much more flexible way where they have a capacity for what I call safe vulnerability, you know, the, the ability, the capacity to feel vulnerable and like they're taking a risk um, and at the same time feel just safe enough to be willing to do that. And I think the world kind of opens up for people at that point. Yeah. It cut moving away from the rigidity to a flexibility and that's part of the healing process. But, you know, and I guess I need to check myself because I kind of, you know, it wasn't very compassionate for me to say that's just pushing through because we do have to push through at times. And also when you're surviving and you are often, you know, something like oppression, Mm -hmm. it didn't end. You're still in it. You know, you may, you may have more resources, but Mm -hmm. the context of oppression is still there. And, and so many other things, trauma that's ongoing, you have to do something to get through it. Right. Right. And so yeah. the pushing through is very adaptive. Also, it's just that the whole continuum is that's not the end of the continuum. That's that's a part of it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think the other thing is that it's less complex, right? It's it's resilient, but in a very simple kind of more black and white way. It's not it, again, it's, not, it, it's like. Siegel talks about is I think it's Dan Siegel who talks about one of the affective neuroscientists talk about um, resilience as being uh, flexibility and and complexity that I think we are moving towards hopefully what we're moving towards is greater complexity and that we use more rigid defenses only in more extreme circumstances we're not just using them because because they're habit and because we don't know any other way of being right that we can hopefully develop more flexible, more open, more safely vulnerable ways of being and, and relating, of seeking help when we're at our when we're at the limits of our own resources, and just leaning back into that kind of more rigid stance um, under extreme extreme circumstances. 
Yes. And that kind of reminds me of the second point that I wanted to make about the problem that I've had with the way resilience has been used in the past and still sometimes is that that other idea that some people are more resilient than others that to me doesn't take into account what the circumstances are that they're working with. Right, right, right. And we almost never really know that until we know someone at the level that we as clinicians get to know people, right? Like where even I'm sure there are moments where all of us in our not best selves may have judgments or at least curiosity about, well, why is this person struggling so much? And then as we keep peeling the onion and unfolding the story, it, you know, I I think this is one of the gifts of being a therapist is that it's very humbling, right? It just shows you, you have the experience over and over again. If you're really listening and if you're listening with compassion and curiosity, it makes, it starts to make sense, right? It starts to make sense how how maybe they've become so impaired, right? Or how these defenses of shutting down and closing off or extreme avoidance or whatever were so protective at an earlier point in their development. And and yeah, that it just begins to make sense. And and so I think those statements are made when we're comparing apples and oranges. Yeah. <laughs> comparing apples and oranges because there's so many things that that, you know, things vary across situations, that, you know, different situations or traumatic experiences happening at different points in development may have different Mm -hmm. effects, what kinds of interpersonal resources are available, what kinds of community resources are available for people. There's all kinds of things that, you know, contextualize uh, resilience, I think. Very, very much so. I so agree with you. It's extremely complex. And and that's the thing is that that whole oversimplifying, that's what really bugs me because people are complex. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, to, to pretend that some are just better than others that I don't like that. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes. No, and the, the elitism or the superiority, I think we have to really watch that, especially in our field. Mm, yeah. So, Eileen, can you talk about how you work with helping people access the their inner resilience in your work? Yeah, I think what's most important is that it actually starts in the beginning of treatment so that when somebody comes in for a first session, my focus is not on, you know, trying to figure out diagnostic categories or do an assessment of pathology. I'm not saying that that's not relevant in some way at some at some points, right? That that can be helpful, but it's not my first approach. It's not the the point or the place at which I'm going to connect with somebody. That what I'm really, I think, really genuinely looking for, and this is what we do in AEDP all the time, and we sometimes talk, call privileging the positive, is to be on the alert and on the lookout for signs of resilience and what we call transformance from the from the very beginning. So places or ways in which people are healthy, in fact, or they have been adaptive in, in truly adaptive ways, how they're likable, how they're courageous, places or aspects or areas of their lives where they really are not unencumbered, you know, as opposed to the places where they are encumbered, where there are ways in which they're interpersonally connected with us or with others in their lives, that kind of we focus on that from the beginning you know, you could call it a strengths perspective, but it's it's also like we don't just settle for the strengths perspective. What we're trying to do is kind of get a hold of that in order to partly to create a safe environment where the, the patient or the client feels seen, feels safe enough, feels valued and respected so that they feel brave and safe enough to be their most vulnerable selves and to kind of share the places of struggle and suffering and stuckness as much as possible. And so that we're, we're kind of approaching it with the, the aim of using their, what we would call an ADP, their self at best to work with the self at worst. So these places where they are most resilient to kind of help bring in and heal and work with the parts that are, that are most stuck 
But I think the other important thing that I would want to say about that is that many people come into therapy kind of knowing that they're stuck and there's a lot of shame around that, right? Like there's, because Mm -hmm. there's still plenty of stigma about being in therapy. And so like they're aware they're stuck. They're kind of finally here because they haven't been able to figure it out on their own. And they are either embarrassed or ashamed that they're kind of, they keep doing the same old thing, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. I think part of resilience oriented work is to help them reframe some of that to see and appreciate that they may still be doing the same old thing and the same old thing that they're ashamed and embarrassed about and sick of sometimes, which is all fine, was they came, I, like I say to my patients a lot, like, well, I think you came by this honestly. You know, when you were five and your mother was like constantly critical, what better option did you have except to kind of shut down or to be super people pleasing or to, you know, what whatever it is, If we understand the adaptations that now are the source of embarrassment and stuckness as something that originated in an environment where there weren't many other options, and this was probably the best this person could do to adapt to adverse circumstances, then that's resilient, right? That was resilient at that time. And that's, I think, also very helpful for people to to feel, to begin to feel less shame, more self-compassion. And that also opens up and kind of frees them up to feel like they have a little bit more choice about, okay, that's how I dealt with that then. You know, are there other ways in which I could deal with similar situations now or deal with, or not, you know, carry that over into this current circumstance where I don't really need those defenses, I'm, but I may not yet know how to be otherwise. Yeah. So one aspect is like helping them see the adaptive nature of that, that strategy. Even that like opens it up that there were other ways they could have tried too. Right. Although I think, you know, usually looking back in the past, they, the, the point of, you know, looking in the past is that they, they either couldn't have or didn't, you know, and what, what can you do about that now? They, but they may be able to now. Yeah. Yeah. and that, and that's the thing that is de-shaming and also differentiating, right? Like what I did as a child, I don't have to do now. And, and they may still need to build up, like actually practice new and different skills and different ways of being that are more appropriate to their, their grown up circumstances. But yeah, I think what I was thinking there, but didn't say well, was that that was the strategy that they found that was adaptive for them, mm-hmm. that they don't know they made a choice at that time because it was just a survival strategy that was like instinctive Mm -hmm. and that there were other things they could have done then that could have been equally like people pleasing or acting out or being Mm -hmm. sick or, you know, none of them are really like things that a child says, well, I'm going to try acting out to see if my (laughs) parents will (laughs) pay attention, you know, but but I guess the what I'm trying to say is that it, it helps the client see that's not just how I am. That's something on a buffet of choices that I didn't consciously know I had then I right. used. And and that was the one that happened to work out the best for me under the circumstances in that time. Right, right. And, and I think part of that is them coming to appreciate how particularly in traumatic or adverse circumstances are like the the repertoire of choices available to us is usually very constrained. Yes. Not, not not by us, right? Like not by the person who's going through it, but by the circumstances themselves or by the other people themselves who are, who also may be very compromised people. Um, Exactly. Give us the whole panoply of healthy, healthful choices. Right. Because obviously that's what someone would go for if it was available to them. Exactly. Yes. Right. And then, you know, I have to mention, as you did before about the neurobiology, you know, when people say, well, I should have run away. I mean, there was no one holding me down. And it's like the freeze response that you had, had it was adaptive in that situation in some way. Maybe it's because it related to a previous experience you'd had where freezing was your safest bet, you know. Right. It wasn't a conscious decision you made Mm -hmm. to help with that self-blame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, exactly. 
Yeah, and you're kind of making me think of Porges's polyvagal theory of of emotion and this idea that we are that our anatomy and our brains as human beings are designed to be able to deal with stress in relationship and not to have to revert to the kind of more wearing use of the sympathetic nervous system to deal with every challenge. But many people who come into therapy are really not accustomed to or not in the practice of using other relationships to help them deal with stress, right? To remain in a kind of calmer parasympathetic state where they can turn to a loved one and say, can I get your help here? Or can I feel some reassurance or something like that? And that's partly what they be, people begin to practice with us, right? Like allowing themselves to make use of us or allowing, just allowing our help that they can be in, states where they're dealing with something that's emotionally or affectively feels hard or big or maybe slightly overwhelming. And that part of the work that we're doing in resilience-oriented therapy or in AEDP is to be with them through, through that process, trusting that they will come out the other side and that there's something to be gained by maybe pr- processing through or feeling their way through something that's hard or painful when they're not alone. Yes. And just that for me brings up, you know, what I know, but it's always good to remember. And it's always good for all of us who are therapists to remember that when the person doesn't have the experience of being helped, then it's going to be hard for them to do that in the therapeutic relationship. It's going to be a big adjustment and that takes time to begin to feel safe. Right. I mean, I remember working with, um, no one specific is coming to mind right now, but a couple of patients where, you know, there was so much trauma or isolation or aloneness that it felt like I could feel the hugeness of the achievement when they were able to use me, you know, when they were able to like lean into me or they dreamt about me or they, they come back in saying, well, I was in this really hard situation and I just saw you or I heard you saying, et cetera, right? And like that in itself is a big breakthrough where they are not alone anymore with their experience, that they are allowing themselves to use another. You know, some people come in with more capacity to do that and some people have very limited capacity to do that. And when they can do that, it's just really great. It is. I, that's beautiful. You reminded me of many times where I may have had a difficult session with someone where it was, you know, for them, there was a lot that was coming up and they were very, it was painful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, when I, when we're ending, I will say, remember, if you need to reach out to me, you know, if things are hard over the next few days and you need a little more support, feel free to reach out. And the person will often say, I know, but I won't. <laughs> and right. um, and then over time, the they first do. time they do, you're like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. not because you want them to be dependent, because right. but because you realize that that's a relational shift mm-hmm. for them. That's mm-hmm. so important. Right, right. And that part of their growth and development involves allowing for some dependency, right, involves them allowing that they do have dependency needs because we all have dependency needs and that we we limit ourselves. I mean, that the other thing that I talk quite a bit about in the, in the book and is evident in the, the transcripts is how much resilience really is interpersonal, right? Instead of this kind of intrapersonal, you know, individualistic, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It all has to come from me that so much of resilience, certainly in, in our early lives, but throughout is is interpersonal that we really need other people and we are designed to to lean into other people when our own you know resources and have hit their limit so when we can't make use of that we can't make use of other people we're really stuck yeah that's that's so true and i think i wish we had more time but on that point is a great place to stop because just because we don't have more time, but (laughs) I'm very grateful to you for talking with me today. And where can people find your book? Because I know I now am thinking how I want my whole staff to read it and some interns that I'm going to have in the fall, you know, how I, how I just think how beneficial it would be for them. And 
to understand this in a really different way. Yeah, the book is on, I don't have my own website, I just haven't gotten around to it, um, but but the book is on Amazon or Norton, W.W. Norton uh, and Company, or the Amazon website, you can get it in either place. And it's called Restoring Resilience, Discovering Your Client's Capacity for Healing. That's so wonderful. And Eileen, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. My pleasure. It was my pleasure, Laura. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Eileen Russell. I really appreciate her perspective and her belief in our own inner resilience. I'm so curious to learn more about AEDP too. I know probably many of you are thinking the same thing. So I do hope to have her return and talk with us more about AEDP. I've heard a lot about it. I have these two friends who are so into it. Hillary Jacobs Hendel, who you've heard twice on my podcast before, is an AEDP therapist. Uh, it's a pretty amazing way of working from my understanding, but I'd love to know more about it. Not going to start training in that quite yet because I need to pace myself with trainings, <laughs> but I'm, I'm really curious about it and interested and just want to thank you all for hanging in there with me as I missed last week's new episode and I do have some great things coming up for you. So look for some very interesting interviews in the weeks to come. Until then, be well and take care. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Being a therapist in private practice, there is a lot to keep track of. I know for me, as an owner of a group practice now with five clinicians, including myself, I would not be able to manage my practice without my EHR system, and I use Therapy Notes. And we use Therapy Notes for scheduling, billing, and managing all the clinical documentation. If you're a therapist who's thinking about getting an EHR for your practice, I highly recommend Therapy Notes. Get two free months by going to therapynotes.com and using keyword therapy chat. That's therapynotes.com and use the promo code therapy chat. Just another reminder that if you'd like to become a member of therapy chat, supporting the podcast while receiving fun member perks and being able to communicate with me one-on-one, go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. If every subscriber donated just $1 per month, therapy chat would be able to keep going strong indefinitely. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.